Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. So this episode is the last of our Halloween group this year. Mm-hmm. It's not so much a fun Halloween romp as it is a horror story. Yeah. I mean, it's not a horror story in the fun exorcist style. It's a <laughs> horror story in the real humans are monsters sometimes style. Um, it's very violent and scary. And it's a story that I have been thinking about for the show literally for years um, I would say the last three years at least. I've had this on my list and then backed off of it and been like, I don't know if I want to talk about this one yet. Because um, it's it's upsetting. Um, the material is very dark. And it's upsetting not only because it involves a murder, it also involves people speaking and behaving in a very cavalier manner about that murder. Uh, It also involves the fate of a young woman and the aftermath of what happens. There is also a pregnancy involved in this murder. So uh, if you are very sensitive or if you typically listen with younger history buffs, this is when I highly recommend pre-screening first. Um, I mean, we're not going to linger on any of the particularly gory elements, but just its bare facts are pretty troubling. Yeah, Maybe for the little ones, go... Go dig up the old episode about Halloween candy. <laughs> yeah, that'd be perfect. We all love a little Halloween candy. Um, yeah, this is this is not the one. But it's one that, like I said, I I have been backing off of it for years, but it keeps staying at top of mind. And it's, uh, for reasons we'll talk about at the very end, I just think it's a story worth telling. Um, and I have some other thoughts on why I kind of, enjoy examining stories like this. Uh, Not trying to sound like a ghoul, but I have a reason. We'll talk about it on Friday. Okay. But for now, we're going to tell you a very troubling story. On February 1st, 1896, in Fort Thomas, Kentucky, a young farmhand named James Hewling was walking along the fence line of the orchards of James Locke's farm, and he made a horrifying discovery. It was a body of what appeared to be a young woman wearing a light blue and white dress, and she had been decapitated. Hewling ran to Locke's house for help, and James Locke, his son Wilbert Locke, and one of their hired hands named Mike Noonan all came from the house, and they went out to the body with him. James Locke then went to Fort Thomas and alerted both the police and the commander of the fort. Soon, police, soldiers from the fort, as well as members of the general public were also on the scene of this grisly discovery. In addition to that blue and white dress, the woman had been wearing tan gloves, black shoes, which will become important, black and blue stockings, a blue underskirt, and a union suit. Her corset, which appeared to have been torn off and had bloody handprints on it, and a piece of her dress were also found nearby. There was also half of a man's torn shirt sleeve at the scene. Blood was pooled at the neck, but it was also found all around the surrounding area. It appeared that the woman had been killed mere hours before the discovery. Some estimates put it in five to seven, but that was just the initial guess. The body was on a slope. The feet were higher up the slope than the torso, The dress was open above the waist, and footprints suggested that a woman had been walking alongside of a man, but at some point had broken into a run by herself until that man had caught up. It was believed that she had physically struggled against him as he subdued her, and then it seemed like her throat had likely been cut. She had several knife marks on one hand, suggesting she had tried to block the knife. So the assumption was that her head had been severed from her body after the murder to try to hide this woman's identity. And while the body had not been touched by anyone before investigators arrived, as word of the murder spread and crowds came, almost all of the evidence that would have been found in the area immediately surrounding the body was trampled. Additionally, people took all kinds of souvenirs from the scene, specifically looking for things like leaves that had blood on them or stray hairs from the victim. 
even branches from the bushes, which would have potentially offered evidence of how the murder had played out, were snapped off by people who wanted to take them home. It rained the afternoon of the discovery, and one report even stated that people gathered buckets of bloody mud as keepsakes. Once the victim's body had been removed, there were also people who went to the undertaker's office where it had been brought to try to see it. Some of these were people who had friends or family who had gone missing. They were hoping to see if this deceased woman was their missing person, but a lot of people just wanted to see the body. At once, theories started to circulate about who this woman might have been and what could have led to her horrific killing. A popular theory that emerged right out of the gate was that she may have been a sex worker who had been involved with a soldier from the fort. And this actually led to the fort's commander, Colonel Cochran, to quickly launch his own investigation within the troops because he didn't want any kind of rumor like that circulating about the men under his command. And this investigation pretty quickly shut those rumors down because Cochran was rapid, but he was thorough. He had accounted for all of the troops' whereabouts on the night of the murder in pretty short order. The head was not found. A nearby reservoir was drained in the hopes that it might be there, but it was not. And as police went through lists of missing women, they found over and over that they were not a match for their victim. There were several incorrect claims about who this was before the victim's true name was known. One was the claim that the body was that of Ella Markland. That claim was made by Ella Markland's mother after she'd been allowed to examine the body herself, and she was 100% convinced that it was Ella. The mother, who's identified in accounts only as Mrs. Hart, explained to police the specific characteristics of the body that matched Ella's. She said she hadn't seen her daughter since New Year's Eve. But this turned out to be a case of a family with poor communication. Ella Markland was really alive. She was working as a maid in a house in Cincinnati. Another claim was that the murder victim was Francisca Engelhart. She had recently married a man named Dr. Kettner in Cincinnati after the two had become pen pals, and Kettner had moved from South Dakota to be with her. Francisca had vanished, and so had Kettner, but it turned out that that's because Kettner's other wife had traveled to Cincinnati and discovered her husband's bigamy, and then Kettner and his new wife had abruptly left for Kentucky. But it took a while to untangle that whole story, and there was a period of time where police were operating on the idea that this body was Engelhart. And it was during that line of investigation that the initial postmortem was performed on the body. And this revealed some troubling pieces of information. This woman was estimated to be about 20 years old. They didn't think she had been sexually assaulted, but she had been four to five months pregnant when the murder was committed. A second postmortem determined that she had not been decapitated after death, as had been thought. She had been decapitated while still alive. But once the Engelhart story was unraveled and that identification was deemed invalid, investigators were once again at a loss for who this person was. So all of that postmortem information was attached to an unknown victim. The case was finally cracked, thanks in large part to a shoe store owner. Lewis Pook owned a shoe store in Newport, Kentucky, and he was friends with James Locke's nephew. Locke, you will recall, owned the orchard where the body was found. And through that nephew, Pook heard about the discovery of the body and the lack of evidence. Pook's shoe store was close to the mortuary that the police had taken the body to, so he, being curious like many people locked up his store and strolled down there. And because he was very well-known in town and very respected, police allowed him in to see the body. But even though he was as fascinated by this crime as a lot of other people, what really caught his eye was the victim's shoes. Her shoes were the one article of clothing that were of high quality, and they were uniquely small. They were a size three. And Pook, being in the shoe business, was curious. He looked at the manufacturer's code on the shoes, which was 2211 To most people, those numbers did not mean anything, but Pook understood them immediately. The 22 referred to the size, 11 was the number of the last that was used to form the shoe, and then the longer number, 62458, was a factory stock number. So suddenly there was a lot more detail about these shoes. 
And Pook followed up on that himself. He was able to trace the shoes to a Greencastle, Indiana shoe store. When detectives went there, it was short work to learn that they had been sold there in the Lewis and Hayes shoe store. But though there was information on who had bought most of that lot of shoes, two were sold without any customer information, and one of those two pairs of shoes was the one that was worn by the murdered woman. Incidentally, we don't bring it up later, but her name was in their register of purchase as buying a a size three pair of shoes, but they hadn't attached it to the make of the shoes. So there was a, a little bit of data mismatch going on there. And simultaneously, as this shoe investigation was going on, the description of the woman's body and clothing had already been printed in papers all over the country. And then a woman named Susan Bryan, who was married to Alexander Bryan and who lived in Greencastle, started to think about the similarities in those descriptions to her daughter, Pearl. Pearl was, at that time, visiting friends in Indianapolis. At least, that is what she had told her family. Pearl's brother, Fred, telegraphed her friends in Indianapolis just to make sure she was okay, and they responded that she was not visiting them. This news was seen first by Western Union manager A.W. Early, who knew the second he saw it that the message conveyed even more than the identity of the deceased. Because of his own social connections to Pearl's circle, he knew who Pearl's likely killer or killers were. Coming up, we'll talk about who Pearl Bryan was, but first we'll take a quick sponsor break. Pearl Bryan was the 12th and youngest child of farmer Alexander S. Bryan and his wife Susan, who, as we said, lived in Greencastle, Indiana. At least seven of those children lived to adulthood, but specifics beyond that are a little bit unclear. And part of that is due to the Bryan family being one of the largest in the area, with many, many people having that name. Pearl's father, Alexander, was successful, and Pearl is often described as the family's favorite in addition to being the youngest. Pearl is described as a young woman who everybody tended to adore. She was smart. She graduated from high school with honors in 1892. And by all accounts, she was very beautiful. After she finished school, Pearl had started teaching Sunday school in Greencastle. And she's described as having an endless list of admirers, but also as a young woman who wasn't especially interested in romances with any of them. She wasn't easily impressed, and most of the young men who expressed their interest in her found themselves her friends, but nothing more. It's worth noting, of course, that these descriptions of her are from accounts that happened after her death, so the odds of anybody saying anything really negative about her were a little lower than they might have been otherwise. She may have been as beloved and virtuous as everyone said, like the Belle of Putnam County, as she was called in one write-up, But we don't really have a way to verify that information. Like, we don't really know how much of this is the the eulogizing of a person after they had died. Yeah. And how much is really what people remember. In 1895, so around the time she was 21, Pearl met a young man named Scott Jackson. Jackson had recently moved to Greencastle from New Jersey with his mother. He had a sister that was already living in the area. And in Greencastle, Jackson became good friends with one of Pearl's close friends, a young man and her second cousin named Will Wood. Scott also enrolled in dental college in Indianapolis, and Will would often visit him in the city, and the two were known to carouse there. And then in the spring of 1895, Will brought Scott to the Bryan home to introduce him, and Pearl is said to have instantly fallen for Jackson. Will later said to the two of them, quote, Pearl was stuck on Jackson from the first time they met. Jackson would come and get my horse and buggy and drive over to Pearl's house when they would often go driving together. Pearl was pretty and ambitious, but I never thought she would do wrong. Now I can see she was perfectly infatuated with Jackson from the start, so much that I am firmly convinced she was completely in his power and he took advantage of his influence over her. So going back to the telegraph manager, A.W. Early, that we mentioned before the break. Early was friends with Will Wood, and through Will, he had learned that Scott Jackson and Pearl Bryan were having a sexual romantic relationship. 
But though he was friends with Wood, Early told the police everything he knew about Wood and Jackson and their connection to Pearl, and specifically that he had seen a letter that Jackson wrote to Wood about the fact that Pearl was going to be a mother and that the two men had corresponded about ways the pregnancy might be terminated. Allegedly, some of those had been tried. There's some talk of medicines being ordered and Wood giving them to Pearl, but none of them worked. The next thing discussed in the letters was an abortion, and that Pearl was going to tell her family she was visiting friends in Indianapolis, while in reality, she would go to Cincinnati for that procedure. With this information, the Greencastle police went to the Bryan home with additional information and clothing samples to confirm that this dead woman was indeed Pearl. Then they sent word to Cincinnati police, leading to the arrest of three men, Scott Jackson, Alonzo Walling, who we'll talk about in a bit, and William Wood. During early questioning, Jackson said that he had last seen Pearl during the holidays, maybe January 2nd, and that he and Pearl were, quote, only friendly. There was also the matter of a valise that Jackson had left in a saloon and then was alleged to have switched out for another and how that valise was missing. Jackson said that he had loaned this suitcase to somebody and that it had not been returned. Jackson was strip-searched, and there were two significant scratches on one of his arms, as well as some blood spatters on a sleeve. To explain, he told police, quote, I was bothered by bugs the other night, and I scratched myself. He also said that he would like to be guarded while in the jail, and at one point asked, quote, hasn't Walling been arrested yet? At that point, they had not considered Walling a suspect, but that resulted in Walling's arrest. While in custody, Jackson was examined by Sergeant Kiffmeyer from the Cincinnati Police Force. Kiffmeyer used a system of measurements known as the Bertillon system to assess Jackson's physicality. So this system was kind of a precursor to fingerprinting and mugshots in that it created a database based on data collected from an individual of criminal identities. This was like specific measurements of parts of their body and that sort of made a profile of their physicality. But Kiffmeyer seems to have applied this same kind of system to uh, the kind of analysis that we would more associate with phrenology. So instead of just measurements built up to identify a person, it was more like this person's head is a murderer's head. And today... Phrenology is recognized as not being a real science. At the same time, Kiffmeyer's assessment of this suspect uh, was really damning at the time. He said of Scott Jackson, quote, every man's head tells its own story. Jackson is another H.H. Holmes. Jackson has the cunning to plot and plan and to conceal. Jackson is a mind far beyond the ordinary. He has a head such as Napoleon would have. Jackson knew fully and realized what lay before him in the murder of Pearl Bryan. Jackson is absolutely incapable of any expression of remorse. The only appeal that can be made to Jackson is through his fear of punishment. Jackson's skull is abnormal and unusually long in proportion to its breadth. It is abnormally developed on the right side in front and on the left side in the rear of the head. Jackson is a natural monster or monstrosity, whichever you will. Look at his portrait. Is that the face of a criminal? Jackson has other peculiarities. His fingers are disproportionately long to his height. Jackson has all the characteristics of a criminal by nature. So if you have long fingers, hide them from the Kiffmeyers of the world. Yeah. I'll also note the guy that developed this system of, like, measurements. We're going to do an episode on him. We are? Yes. Okay, he's come up in a past episode, although we did not name him specifically. That's right. Uh, Should we tell listeners what that was? He was the person that did the handwriting analysis in the Dreyfus affair. Yes, which will come up. Yeah. In a very soon episode. All right. Um, Knowing the horrific outcome of the relationship between Scott Jackson and Pearl, it's easy to envision him as like a mustache twirling villain, particularly after you hear this description from this police analysis. And while he was undoubtedly evil and apparently lacking in a conscience, his potential for violence was not at all apparent to anyone close to him or Pearl. 
Her parents are said to have really, really loved him, and surely they and others thought that the two might make a future together. There are a lot of writings about how they were totally fine with the two of them sitting in the parlor alone together because they knew nothing would happen. But it's also likely that because Pearl had not been involved with anyone else romantically up to that point, she was easily manipulated by Jackson, who seemed much more worldly than her. By all accounts, Scott Jackson was charming, and he seemed to be a fine and upstanding young man to everybody in Indiana. But it turned out he had been in serious legal trouble before he met Pearl Bryan. He'd concealed his past when moving from New Jersey to Indiana. When he arrived in Greencastle with his mother, it was after he had been involved in an embezzlement scandal as an employee of the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. His job there had included opening and routing mail, and it turned out that he, along with a partner named Alexander Letts, had been keeping checks that came into the railroad and cashing them for themselves. By the time this racket was discovered, they were estimated to have stolen $32,000. They used the money to live a life of drinking, betting on races and sport, and generally just partying. When the railroad discovered this missing money, it was apparently pretty obvious that Scott Jackson was guilty. He cut a deal to turn state's evidence and testified against his partner in the scheme, Alexander Letts. Once the trial was over, Letts was in state prison, and Jackson was on his way out of Jersey City. And now we get to Alonzo Walling. Alonzo was from Mount Carmel, Indiana, to the east of Indianapolis. He had worked in a glass factory as a child, and when that factory had closed, his mother arranged for him to attend Indianapolis Dental College. It's there where he met Scott Jackson. If you're wondering why he was working in a glass factory as a kid, it's because his father died when he was very, very young, and the family needed the income. So Scott Jackson and Alonzo Walling also roomed together in Cincinnati later on. And Alonzo was aware not only of Scott Jackson's relationship with Pearl, but also that he had gotten her pregnant and that he intended to kill her. And Walling confessed to all of this when he was brought in by police. In a statement to police, Walling said that on Christmas Day of 1895, so a little more than a month before the murder, quote, Jackson took me into a corner of the room and told me that he and Billy Wood had gotten Pearl Bryan into trouble and that he must get rid of her. He suggested two ways in which it might be done. One of the plans he suggested was to take her to a room and kill her there and leave her. Then he spoke up quickly and said, no, I have a sudden thought as something often tells me when I am on the wrong idea. It would not do to leave her there, so I will instead cut her to pieces and drop the pieces in different vaults around town. Walling was also examined by Kiff Meyer, and Kiff Meyer analyzed his head measurements too, of the second suspect, the sergeant stated, quote, Walling's head is that of a commonplace criminal. He's just the opposite of Scott Jackson. At the same time, Walling is utterly void of any ability or cunning to plot and plan and to conceal. Jackson knew fully and realized what lay before him in the murder of Pearl Bryan. Walling had not realized the enormity of the crime and is supremely indifferent to the consequences and to the crime committed. No appeal, not even the fear of punishment, will have any impression on Walling. We kind of said this earlier, but I'm just going to say again, you can't know these things for measuring a person's skull. No. Are you sure, Tracy? Can we measure our skulls and find out that I'm a monster? I hope not. Probably. I don't need a skull measurement to tell me that. Uh, Walling also said that Jackson asked medical students about fast-acting poisons and that he told Walling he had a combination of arsenic and cocaine in a syringe which he intended to use to kill Pearl. Walling also said to police, quote, I don't think it killed her at once and that she tried to fight him off when he went to cut off her head. Walling also mentioned that valise we brought up earlier and the particularly unsettling detail that, quote, I think it was after midnight, he came in with a valise and I saw him open it and say, you are a beaut, you are. He thought I was asleep. He told authorities that he thought that Jackson had buried the head. But Jackson told his own version of the story and that placed the blame on Wood and Walling. He said it was Wood and not himself who had gotten Pearl pregnant. Then that Wood masterminded the murder. 
Jackson told police, quote, Wood wrote to me telling me of the trouble and asking me to assist him out of it. I showed the letter to Walling and he volunteered to undertake the job. It was then planned to bring the girl here. She arrived on Tuesday of last week. And what I saw and know of her after her arrival here, I have told. And of course, William Wood told yet another version of the story. Under questioning, he indicated that both Jackson and Pearl had confided in him about their sexual relationship and about the pregnancy. He confirmed that an abortion had been discussed and that he had been the one to tell Pearl about that plan and that a friend of Walling's was to perform the procedure. It was later determined by police that Walling was the one who intended to perform it. Wood also said that he had intended to accompany Pearl to that appointment, but that his father had requested him at home that day. Wood was, according to accounts of the day, registered by police, but not detained at that time. He was eventually indicted with abetting an abortion, but not murder. And then he kind of vanishes from the historical record. The missing valise was brought to the police by a saloon keeper named John Kugel, and that valise was used in the questioning of Jackson. Jackson said it had been filled with Miss Bryan's things, but those were now in the river. He also said that it and another smaller valise that had been found sitting in a barber shop that both Jackson and Walling often went to were both pearls. The proprietor of a pub frequented by Walling and Jackson was also questioned, as was a Black employee of the pub named Alan Johnson. This sounds like a strange scenario where the suspects were also present during these witness interviews. Obviously, police work has changed a lot since 1896. Both men stated that Jackson, Walling, and Pearl Bryan had been in the saloon and that Jackson had ordered a whiskey for himself and a sarsaparilla for Pearl, and that they left in a carriage together around 7 p.m. They also said Jackson was back the next night by himself in an odd mood and complaining of a headache with a valise. Yeah, there's a whole secondary part of this where that saloon may or may not have also been a brothel, and that Alan Johnson had also implicated another man as having been the carriage driver, which turned out to not be true. It gets very complicated. This is one of those stories where I'm trying to pare down an awful lot of information for clarity. So if you go looking and you're like, why didn't that get mentioned? That's why. Um, There was also a letter that was intercepted within the Postal Service. This had been written by Scott Jackson to Will Wood. It had actually been written the day he was arrested, several hours prior to being taken in. And this uh, letter used a code that the men had worked up, referring to Pearl as a man named Bert. Jackson explained this code to police. And this letter instructed Will to write to the Bryan family as though the letter is from Pearl and say that she has found work in Chicago or somewhere else and will write more later. The letter has instructions to burn it after it's been read and concludes with, quote, stick by your old chum, Bill, and I will help you in the same way, sometimes. There is also a postscript that reads, quote, be careful what you write to me. When questioned about this letter, Jackson very casually confessed to writing it, but then he said that Walling had made him write it, and Walling, of course, denied that. Basically, both Jackson and Walling told the story repeatedly and with ever-changing details. Between the two of them, they gave several different locations for the missing head, none of which proved out when investigated. They both continued to blame the other and Will Wood for Pearl's murder. The papers ran new confession after new confession as each man added to the story, At one point, Walling had stated, quote, for several days before the murder, Jackson would sit about our room and read a medical dictionary to try and learn all about the effect of poisons. He finally selected cocaine as the most suitable for his purpose. At last, he took four grains of cocaine and put in 16 drops of water. He told me that he was going to give the cocaine solution to Pearl and make her drink it and that it would kill the vocal powers. She would be unable to scream or talk, and then he was going to cut her head off. Jackson admitted to purchasing cocaine, but said that he gave it to Walling. Even when put in a room with the corpse of Pearl Bryan, both men continued this just really bickery rhetoric that the other one was lying. But as the two men had tried to lay blame on one another, they had both implicated themselves 
so deeply in the murder that to most people, the fine points of who did what hardly mattered. Articles ran in paper under headlines like, both are guilty from early on in the reporting of all their various statements. Yeah, it kind of becomes like a matter of degrees of like, well, I bought the cocaine and took her in the carriage, but I didn't actually kill her. And the other guy did. And he said the exact opposite. So it was clear they were both involved. Nobody was really all that concerned about like who did exactly what part of it. Uh, Coming up, we are going to talk about the legal proceedings that were held regarding the murder. But before we do, we will take a break and hear from Stuff You Missed in History Class's sponsors. So all of the things that we have talked about up to this point happened in the course of less than a week. Pearl had been found on February 1st, Jackson had been arrested on February 5th, and Walling had been taken into custody in the very early hours of February 6th. Then there was this moment of a very strange confession, not from any of them, but from a woman named May Hollingsworth, and that happened shortly after both men had been arrested. Initially, Hollingsworth made a statement to police that she had met Pearl at Union Station, quote, by chance, and that she had procured drugs for Miss Bryan, presumably to end the pregnancy, and then promised to meet her again two days later. But May said she stood Pearl up for that second meeting. The next day, Hollingsworth said she had performed an operation, presumably an abortion, on Pearl Bryan on January 31st. She said this operation had gone wrong and that Pearl had died as a consequence and that the body had been dumped after that. She claimed to have a letter that was written by Scott Jackson explaining that Pearl had died in his room and that a Black man had cut off her head to try to help hide her identity. Police came to the conclusion that Hollingsworth was probably addicted to opium and was an acquaintance of Jackson and Walling and that what was going on here was she was trying to save them. Whatever was happening, her confession was thrown out. The Indianapolis Journal article relaying this story says glibly, quote, anyway, Miss Hollingsworth is a study. When the coroner's inquest was held on February 11th, the facts of the case were laid out based on what had been confirmed through investigation. The most damning for Jackson and Walling was that while they had been seen getting into a cab outside Wallingford's saloon on the night of January 31st, no one could account for their whereabouts from 7 p.m. that night until the next morning. The coroner's jury announced their conclusions, which were that the body was Pearl Bryan, that she had been given cocaine, quote, for reasons unknown, that she had been decapitated while alive, and that she was last seen with Jackson and Walling. The next step in the justice system was the convening of the grand jury of Campbell County, Kentucky, and this quickly resulted in an indictment against both of the suspects. At this point, both men were being held in Cincinnati, Ohio, so there was a little bit of legal lag as the paperwork was done to get them transferred to Kentucky. The defendant's counsel wanted them to stay in Ohio because they felt they would be lynched in Kentucky before the trial could even take place. The governor of Kentucky at the time, William O'Connell Bradley, assigned the entire state militia to the Campbell County Sheriff, Julius Plummer, to try to keep the prisoners safe. The defense counsel continued to find reasons to delay this transfer, but finally, on March 17th, the two men were moved. A crowd witnessed them departing Cincinnati, and another crowd witnessed them arriving in Newport, Kentucky. Yeah, there, throughout all of this, the police departments involved were constantly just glutted with people who wanted to witness some of this. Uh, Jackson and Walling were arraigned on Monday, March 23rd. Both men pled not guilty. Four days after the arraignment, Pearl Bryan was at last laid to rest, almost two months after her death. Pearl's parents wanted to wait even longer. They were adamant that she should not be buried without her head. But Pearl's siblings begged their parents to just let her body be interred until they finally acquiesced. The day of the burial at Greencastle's Forest Hill Cemetery, a huge crowd gathered to see Pearl interred, as requested by her parents at the highest point in the cemetery. 
Scott Jackson's trial was set to start on April 7th, and Walling's would start as soon as Jackson's was concluded. Although hundreds of onlookers had attended the arraignment, there had been a decision to limit who could watch the trial, so the crowd inside the courtroom was small. Even so, Jackson was kicked by a woman who was seated in the courtroom as he walked by. In the court of public opinion, he was guilty, but the trial didn't start that day. Though Jackson's attorney, L.J. Crawford, had been given two weeks from the arraignment to prepare for the case, he was insistent that he needed more time. He wanted a month, he got two more weeks. One of the concerns was the testimony of William Wood, which Crawford said he had not had time to prepare for, and that he had witnesses he could call that would indicate that Wood was not trustworthy. He just needed more time to arrange for that. Finally, on April 22nd, the Jackson trial began. During the trial, the prosecution made the case that Scott had charmed Pearl into a relationship that resulted in pregnancy, that he had arranged for her to travel to Cincinnati, that he was seen with her in the two days leading up to her death, that he had been in possession of Pearl Satchel after her death, and that he had been seen showing off a dissecting knife in the weeks leading up to the murder. One surprising witness was included. That was George H. Jackson. He was a black Surrey driver who said he had been hired by Alonzo Walling the night of the murder to take the trio of Walling, Jackson, and Brian from Cincinnati to Kentucky. He had approached police after the coroner's inquest with this information, but newspaper coverage at the time indicated that his story had been deemed untrustworthy. According to George Jackson, quote, he heard a noise that sounded like a woman suffering, and they moved around and shook the carriage, and they broke a glass. And then I was scared, and I put my left hand out and my right hand on the lantern, and it kind of bent down, and I started to jump off. And I said, there is something wrong in the back part of that carriage, and I don't care anything about this job. And I went to hand the lines to him, and when I went to look at him, I was looking at a gun. He said, if you don't drive this horse, I will blow you to hell. Of course, I understood and began to drive the horse. George said that after he saw the two men disembark with a woman in between them, he fled the scene in a panic, although he had been instructed to wait down the road and listen for them to whistle for a pickup when they were ready. Yeah, that person he's referring to when he said he tried to hand the reins to him was Alonzo Walling, who had sat up on the seat with him to direct him where to go. So it seems surprising to me that after his testimony had initially been talked about in the papers as though it was worthless, he was kind of an important witness in the actual trial. The rest of the trial relayed the various accounts given by people connected to Jackson, including Wood and the investigators who had questioned both men. We've gone over a lot of those details already. And on May 14th, Scott Jackson was found guilty of murder in the first degree. Walling's trial took place the following month. It included a lot of the same information. And on June 18th, he too was found guilty of murder in the first degree. Both men were sentenced to death. Scott Jackson and Alonzo Walling were hanged on March 22nd, 1897. Even up to the last minute, Scott Jackson was changing his story. He briefly claimed before heading to the gallows that Walling was innocent. He said this with so much conviction that the governor was contacted. The governor indicated that if Jackson stated on the gallows that Walling was innocent, that the execution of Jackson could continue, but that Walling's would be stayed. But after counting down the clock, Jackson said he could not say that Walling was innocent. No, and they were both hanged. One of the things that's jarring about this entire case, if you start looking at it, is the way that Pearl is kind of sidelined in almost all of the writing about it from the time. Whether that's due to the unsavory idea that a woman that everyone perceived as innocent had become pregnant, or because the gruesome nature of her death was just too much to handle, people talked a lot about the logistics of the murder and the suspects while not really talking about Pearl Bryan much at all. The odd nature of Pearl's death and the trial was summed up in the opening of a Chicago Chronicle multi-page analysis of the story that appeared on May 10, 1896, so as those trials were wrapping up. And it read, quote, Pearl Bryan's murder will always be a strange and pathetic story in the annals of crime. 
by reason of all that sprung up in connection with it almost daily, running into the very last days of the trial of one of the accused, Scott Jackson, some of which fell to pieces as rapidly as they had been constructed. The chains of circumstances, which often seemed complete, only to be broken in a moment. The previous life of the girl in Greencastle, Indiana, where she grew up without a whisper of suspicion against her reputation until her headless body was identified. The story is without parallel. There was something in connection with the butchery of the victims of Holmes that was so revolting that the public nearly forgot to bestow that sympathy which usually follows such cases. I'm sorry this is not a fun Halloween episode. I promise I tried for fun ones, and this one has just been lurking. It's been lingering there. It really has. Um, And we can talk more about it in Behind the Scenes, but I do have a very brief and fun and very Halloween-y listener mail, which unfortunately is really a description of a picture. Uh, This (laughs) is from our listener, Brandy, who sent us the cutest Halloween card of her puppies, Merle and Luca, One, I'm not sure which is which, one is a little fluffy baby who is black, and one is a much larger dog who is black and white, and they're both dressed as snails, and it just is a big trick-or-treat card. It's the cutest thing. Brandy, thank you. This was like a delight, and I actually opened it after I had finished writing this this episode outline, and I was like, oh, that was exactly what I needed. So hopefully that's exactly what listeners need to, to contemplate adorable dogs dressed as snails and looking pretty relaxed about it, I must say. Um, so so uh, there's there's a Halloween stinger on the end of this not very fun episode. Uh, if you would like to write to us, send us all of your pet Halloween costume pictures, I beg. Uh, if you would like to write to us, you can do that at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History. And if you have not subscribed, you can do that on the iHeartRadio app or wherever else you listen to your favorite shows. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.